Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cinema Organ Society's Ask That. Now, of course, you know the rules. Time to like and subscribe. And if you've enjoyed it, feel free to comment at any point. Well, today we're very privileged to welcome the Society's musical advisor. Not only that, he's a fantastic musician on both uh, theatre and classical pipes and has travelled around the world. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Hills. Hello, Richard. Hello, Damon. Very nice to see you. So as before, in the next 25 minutes or so, we'll go through as many of your questions as possible. And the first one is a very easy one, which is what was the first theatre organ you heard and what age were you? That's a very easy one to start with. I was seven years old and the first theatre organ I heard was the Wurlitzer at the Thursford Collection in Norfolk. I know that with uh, so many people these days, their first exposure comes from either Thursford or the Tower Ballroom and mine was the first of those. It was uh, a family holiday that I took with my grandparents and I remember the feeling of anticipation of going to see the collection because we'd been used to going to steam fairs and seeing uh, mechanical organs and all of that, that stuff. So even though I didn't know what a theatre organ was at that stage, I was looking forward to visiting the collection and the great day arrived and I was confronted with Europe's fourth largest Wurlitzer and Robert Wolfe at the helm and it was literally a life changing experience. Well, that's wonderful. Now, sometimes organists exhibit an exaggerated use of the expression pedal. What's your philosophy with respect to use of the expression pedals or pedal? And how would you advise students seeking to improve their expression pedal technique? OK, well, uh, this is a question I think has been around since the, the dawn of the theatre organ, hasn't it? I'm, I'm sure I've read examples in past journals of reviewers commenting on the unnecessary pumping of the swell pedal. And it's something, I suppose, which is very easy to do because we all like to tap our feet to something which is infectious rhythmically. And so it can be uh, uh, almost like a subconscious thing to do if you're not careful. My philosophy, particularly with an organ which is completely enclosed, is not an astounding one, and that is that every phrase, every, every musical phrase, needs to have a shape. And roughly speaking, it's arch-shaped. It has a, a beginning, an end, and a high point in the middle. And the work of the swell pedal is mechanically to, um, to conjure up the, the image the, in, the, in the mind's ear of, uh, of giving every phrase that shape. And I think that the, that gesture of, of down for strong and up for, for light is something which is much more ingrained in our psyche. I think everyone has it to some degree, uh, whether you're driving your car, down means faster on the accelerator pedal, doesn't it? If you are um, wanting to tighten something up, you tense and then you, you relax. So tension, release, uh, on, off, up, down. It's the same kind of idea. And when you are shaping a musical phrase, I, I think you always want to, to point and, and lean into the phrase to the high point. And that's the same gesture as you would do with your foot. Um, now that's, that's of course only one way that you can shape a musical phrase. And when we talk about classical playing and talk about instruments which don't have a swell box, uh, you don't have the luxury of a, a swell pedal to help you with the phrasing. There are other ways you can do it too. You can adjust the timing and the articulation of the notes you play to give the same effect. And um, I'm reminded of a, an occasion where I played a performance at Watford Town Hall and just before the concert started, the swell shutters on the organ broke. Something went wrong with the, the mechanism and uh, we had to, to prop them open to get any sound out, but there was no control. And after some umming and ahhing, I've I played the concert with no swell control and <laughs> nobody noticed. And I think that the reason for that is if you're using appropriate registrations in conjunction with the, 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 the swell pedal motion, uh, it's the whole package that, that aids with the phrasing of the music. Uh, again, I'm reminded of a great, great musical artist, Professor Thomas Murray, who until recently was in charge of the, the great Newbury Memorial Organ at Yale University, one of the greatest musical instruments in the world. And uh, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but in a masterclass, I think a student asked him where the swell pedal should be in this particular phrase. And his answer was in motion. So I think every single musical phrase needs to have a shape to it. And that's in, in all forms of music making. It's, it's in singing, particularly, of course, if you, if you sing a musical phrase, uh, the, the structure of the phrase is determined by your breath, 
your breath control, um, if you are um, playing an orchestral instrument, the heavier you dig in, uh, if, for example, a string instrument, the more intense the sound is. And it, it's all interconnected. And really, I think you just have to be sensitive to the needs of a musical phrase and to use your ears. And in working on a rain, an arrangement, just be aware of what your right foot is doing. And you, you get into the habit of training yourself to, uh, to, to express in that way with that same gesture, down for more, back for less, ebb and flow. It's a very long-winded answer, but it's quite a large subject. Now, the next question reads, I asked the same question to Nigel Ogden, but would really value your thoughts as well. I'm a professionally trained classical organist and want to start playing the theatre organ. Could we have three key points as to best ways to transfer my skills, given the fact you play both very well? <laughs> That's very kind of them to say. Uh, and an interesting question. Uh, thank you for asking it to me as well. Um, I, I enjoyed Nigel's answer to that question and indeed I've enjoyed watching all of the Ask That series so uh, all the more um, reason to, to thank you for inviting me to take part. Um, I, I don't suppose my answer would be that different from Nigel's. Uh, three key points, well I would say get to know a bit about the instruments, I, I'll unpack these as we go along, uh, get to know a little bit about the instruments, get to know a bit about the repertoire, and get to know a little bit about arranging and how it's done. Um, the first thing I would say is if you're starting from the point of view of having a, a good trained technique, then that's wonderful. That's a really good start because uh, the theatre organ is hard. It's a tricky instrument. Uh, it's tricky to coordinate uh, all the things you need to do in order to facilitate music making. That's getting back to the, the question about what I enjoy about Maclean's playing in particular is the, the way that the, the organ doesn't get in the way of making music. So uh, the first of those, getting to know the instrument. Well, the first thing I say to people is, uh, is don't treat the theatre organ on its own terms as though it's in a vacuum. It, you know, it's, it's not an instrument that exists in its own bubble. It's not like saying, I use my fingers to play the French horn, uh, I would really like to play the theatre organ. Okay, that's a very different discipline. And I think sometimes people get a little bit fixated about the fact that they might consider the theatre organ to be a completely different discipline. I don't think it is. It's an organ after all. So I think often the most helpful thing to do is to recognise the similarities. They both have manuals and pedals and swell pedals and stops and pipes. And there's a lot of common ground there, as perhaps evidenced by um, the fact that for some time I've been uh, dragging bits of light music kicking and screaming onto the onto the classical organ and, uh, and um, trying to do them justice in that medium. So uh, get to know a little bit about the theatre organ and feel comfortable that there is a lot of crossover. Uh, thereafter, I would say look into the into the repertoire of it. Oh, and um, going back a stage, sorry, I've already doubled back on myself. I would say that, yes, there are certain techniques which you need to assimilate in order to play light music on the organ. That's not specific to the theatre organ, that's on any organ. You know, you have to, to, to assimilate certain techniques to be able to convey the music light music and, and song effectively. But I think of that just in the same way that when you're playing different genres of classical music, you have to assimilate the techniques necessary for appropriate performance. You know, I wouldn't play Brahms and uh, Schumann and Mendelssohn. Well, Mendelssohn's an interesting one, but Brahms and Schumann and um, Parry and Vaughan Williams in the same way that I would approach de Grigny or Bach. Uh, you know, there are techniques and, and uh, stylistic things that you have to deal with when examining all of that repertoire and playing lighter music has its own set of techniques which you have to simulate uh, but you're still playing them on a keyboard instrument so let's not forget that fact. When uh, dealing with registration as well it's very helpful to know how your instrument works, what, what's going on under the bonnet, uh, under the hood as our American friends would say. How is the sound produced? Um, get used to the idea of the extension principle in the theatre organ, the idea that multiple stops come from one rank of pipes. Then you can start looking at the repertoire and uh, doing lots and lots of listening. Um, as I've said before, I listen a lot to music which is not organ music and not music 
played on the organ from different disciplines. I, I like to listen to, to orchestras and choirs and things. Uh, but you do need to know the various different things that you can play on the theatre organ, be it light music, transcription. Um, the theatre organ, of course, has another angle, which is Broadway pops, popular song. So listen to Vera Lynn, listen to that kind of, to singers, to Sinatra, to Ella Fitzgerald, to get an idea of the sound world that you're dealing with. Then actually, if you're a classical organist, what I would do would be to explore the lighter works of people like Whitlock uh, and Elgar and Vaughan Williams and Parry and Stanford, because those composers weren't writing in their own vacuum. The theatre organ was around, certainly in the time of Whitlock, and jazz was around. And some of the names I've just mentioned who were making music in those worlds were around and were known to to these composers. Uh, we know for a fact that Percy Whitlock used to tune into Quentin McLean's broadcasts from the Trocadero. And uh, when you deal with the lighter end of those composers' repertoire, it's really not that much of a leap from that to getting into playing the work of Eric Coates and um, Hayden Wood and Frederick Curzon and, and some of those people that we like to play. So that gets back to the point of know the similarities before you start worrying about the differences. Uh, so get to know the repertoire a little bit. And then perhaps the third thing I would say would be get hold of some pre-written arrangements for the theatre organ, because as I think Nigel mentioned, if I remember correctly, the theatre organist does have to be an arranger. That's quite a, a, a separate discipline from being a transcriber, which is a lot easier because you have the score in front of you and you're just working out how to make it fit the instrument. Whereas uh, the arranging side comes in particularly when you're playing pop songs, Broadway melodies, popular song from the great American songbook, that sort of thing, where you're essentially doing a cover version to, to use a more up-to-date term. And an orchestrator or an arranger like Nelson Riddle or Robert Farnham would take a, a copy of the sheet music and make an arrangement for some of these people and you build up muscle memory as to how to go about creating an arrangement that's idiomatic of the style that you are listening to in in other forms of music um, and that can be very daunting if you're not used to doing it particularly if you're not used to improvising and so I would say get hold of uh, a copy of some of the arrangements done by Jesse Crawford for the Hammond organ. Uh, Dave Coleman wrote some really excellent arrangements for home organs and spinets. Uh, Rex Curry, you know, those names that, that pop up from time to time in, in our world. And I'm sure eBay and Amazon are groaning with uh, copies of that music, which you can get. Um, and that's a very good sort of primer course on how to distribute your hands and your feet across the manuals and the pedals and the swell pedals. It gives you a very good idea of musical texture, chorded melodies, solo melodies, how we mix the two together, when it's an appropriate time to change registration, all that kind of stuff uh, is, is uh, written into those arrangements. And so I think it can be a really helpful uh, way to go about learning how to do it. Once you get the, the idea, then of course you can go and try the same techniques with your own arrangements, but it, it's a good idea for knowing where to start. Um, of course, this is a, a topic that we can hold whole days worth of, of workshops on. Um, so know the instruments and recognize the similarities, assimilate the, te the techniques needed for the repertoire, get into it perhaps via the lighter end of the classical repertoire. Um, learn a bit about the repertoire and do lots of listening to the sorts of things we play on the theatre organ and get a head start with arranging by looking out some pre-written arrangements. Is that a reasonable start? I, I, I think that that would get anybody going in the right direction. <laughs> okay, All right. it's a complicated topic and um, there are different ways of approaching it, but th that's perhaps... The, if you want three starter points, that, that's that's what I would, what I would suggest. Might be one for a, a longer session. <laughs> oh, definitely, yeah. Well, the next question is very simply: Why are your CD stroke album recordings so infrequent? Oh, um, okay. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I might question what you mean by frequent. Uh, let's see, how many have I 
done, I think I've done, is it five? You probably know better than I do, Damon. I think I've done five solo discs now. Uh, the first being in the late 90s. So that averages out at once, one every four or five years, roughly speaking, doesn't it? Um, and in addition to that, I've contributed to most of the last 10 years worth of ATOS <laughs> convention recordings and COS convention recordings and done some things for YouTube as well. So um, I wasn't aware that it was that infrequent. I mean, I suppose it comes down to the big question of what are recordings for? Um, I mean, you work a lot with recordings yourself and I'd, I'd be interested on your take on that. Why do we make recordings? What, what would you say if I asked you that question? I think it would be uh, a, a, as a time capsule, um, you know, of, of recording one thing at the, at the one time. And I suppose that could have its advantages and disadvantages because you uh, people change over time. Well, indeed, uh, you've hit the nail on the head. That would be my uh, first answer to that question. Uh, I mean, obviously, in, in days past, there was a commercial aspect, uh, a necessary commercial aspect to making recordings. And uh, the likes of Sidney Torch and Reg Dixon and, um, uh, uh, you know, Harold Ramsey, the great names of the day, Quentin McLean, uh, had a commercial side to things. And it was the days before the internet. So it was a necessary part of keeping yourself in the public eye and of... Uh, telling what the story that you wanted to tell and of course making some money now in this day and age i think that that is not uh, the primary consideration because uh, as anyone who's in the business knows you don't go into making cds in order to, to make a lot of money uh, and you probably don't do it necessarily to, to to spread the word it's always great to to have merchandise available at, at your gigs, for example, and if people want to take a, a souvenir away, then obviously that's 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 wonderful, and we're all very grateful when when they do, and it's it's flattering that people want to hear more. But in terms of making frequent recordings, uh, for me, recording is not just about doing theatre organ favourites volume nine hundred and sixty eight. Uh, you know, it's it's about having something to say, having a, a musical idea or um, as you say, wanting to capture your playing at a particular point in in your development. I, I play very differently in 2021 from how I did in 2011 and certainly how I did in 10 years before that. And I, I do think it's important, and those of us who play not just for a living, but because we love it and because it's our life, want to feel that we're leaving behind some kind of legacy. You know, when we're when we're six feet under, that's what we have to uh for people to remember us by 50 60 70 years hence um so i have to to be gripped by a musical idea or something i want to say or or um, an instrument that i think particularly deserves to be recorded and is in a, a good phase in its life a classic example of all of that being the the disc that uh was I recorded at Southampton Guildhall. There was an instrument which was massively under-recorded, which had been on the verge of being unplayable for the best part of 20 years. Um, under-recorded, certainly, since the days of Reginald Porter Brown. And so that was an obvious candidate for saying, yes, I really want to record that organ and to bring it back to the recording medium with digital technology and uh, to capture it at that point in its life when Peter Hammond and, and Associates had just done a large amount of work on it and got it sounding really good. And at the same time, that chimed in with the fact that I thought a lot of British music was under-recorded and I wanted to, to tie the two together. So classic example of having something you want to say and an instrument on which you want to say it. And that, that's an obvious one. Uh, and it's also a reason why people... In, well, it's a reason why I've, I've been slightly irritated in the past and I'm sure many people who perform in public feel likewise of unsolicited things appearing on YouTube, for example, uh, with the best one in the world. And I do appreciate that people are often very well-meaning and it's wonderful. And I'm, I'm very grateful if they enjoy something sufficiently that they want to, to put it on YouTube. But getting back to that idea of musical legacy and where you feel you are on the journey of your own playing, 
if I'd said yes to everything that people had asked me to to put up on the internet by now in in 60 years time people would look back at my legacy and think uh, oh yes Richard Hill's left us with with 68 different recordings of Tiger Rag and uh, that's not necessarily how I want to be remembered um, it's great fun to, to do that at the end of a concert of course but if you then pluck it out of context and just present it as 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 its own story on the internet it takes on a different meaning uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite careful about uh, the sorts of things I release. So that's a long-winded way of saying I don't make a habit of making recordings for their own sakes. I, I want it to, to tell a story and to, to aid the message I want to get across. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do listen to what I do, I hope, um, reasonably critically. And I um, like to explore new things. And if I'm at a point where... I think, yes, I, I need to, to say something musically and to commit it to disc. And if an instrument comes along with a, with a producer I want to work with, then, then that's when we, that we, we get stuff done. Um, but uh, I certainly, uh, that's the, the final thing to say really is I, I don't necessarily enjoy the process of making recordings. I, I don't know many people who do. Uh, it's like holding a microscope up to yourself uh, and it can sometimes make for, for painful uh, listening. It's a great way to, to progress and to advance. And if you're, you're a student, I, I always say, record yourself. It's the best way of, of, of learning, really, from your mistakes. Uh, but, um, and I, I, I don't feel like that about broadcasting, interestingly enough. I love broadcasting, and that's a very different mindset, I think. You get one chance to do it really well, and, and you're up for that, that, uh, that challenge. But making recordings are a little bit more elongated and you're always wondering whether if you take and do another take you can do it better that sort of thing um so add all those things together and hopefully you've got a, a long-winded reply of why there aren't 69 recordings of uh, richard hills commercially available every year but um but it, it you know recordings are important i think they're important to get right and it's important that you do something that you believe in now, you've played uh, many theatre and straight organs. Have you ever got involved with the practical side of the instrument? Yes, massively. Uh, right from a very early age, I was always really interested in how the instruments were put together, how they worked. Over the years, that's been really useful as well, because I've been able, in, a, in, in, in concert situations, for example, to go and tune a note that's slipped or fix something that's broken if there's not a technician on hand who knows how to do so. I also find it really interesting. I grew up in a very practical family. My grandfather was an engineer by trade, so he was always fixing things. And I've inherited that bug to some degree. And uh, in terms of organ building, there was a, a point, you know, when you go through your sort of teen years and, and you're wondering what to do with, with your professional life. Um, there was a point where I really seriously thought about becoming a professional organ builder. And I actually went and did work experience with Mander organs here in London uh, back at the time. So I was considering that uh, before music became the, the obvious uh, uh, career path for me. Uh, and I've been very fortunate really to be able to indulge that interest over the years. I've, I've been on the, the crew that's rebuilt a number of instruments, uh, famously the new gallery organ, I think, Robert Rowley and I just about re-leathered that entire organ between us uh, when it was being restored back in 2005, six. So I learned how to do all that and um, certainly learned how to, how to tune. Um, I'm still, I think, on the books as a, a key holder for Harrison and Harrison and uh, certainly used to enjoy going out holding notes and learning how to tune and, and how things were put together. And uh, of course, I've been involved over the years in a number of theatre organ rescue missions um, and so I, I feel like I've put in my time my apprenticeship of driving van loads of organ parts through the night questioning my sanity in doing so as, as we all do um, but I and I also hope it's given me an appreciation for the wonderful skill that goes into preparing those instruments so that people like me can feel that we can give of our best when we're playing them uh, wonderful organ curator in the states kurt mangel likes to say i, I uh, he that is to say he holds the notes up so that artists can push them down and that's a really good analogy and I, i'm very mindful of the work that goes into keeping the machinery that word again 
in tip-top condition because it is a piece of machinery. And in order to forget about the fact that you're operating a machine and make music, the organ has to be in first class condition. And that's one of the things that it's very hard to get across to people who don't play. Uh, well, this kind of works or it's making a sound. So why, why is that not good enough? Uh, and you have to think, well, yes, it does work, but that's the beginning of the journey, uh, not the end. And for me, the, the, the most pleasurable experiences uh, of playing instruments and of concertizing and recording come where you're working with a technician who really knows their stuff and approaches it from a musical point of view. Um, I used to love working uh, down at Worthing with the late Jim Buckland for that reason, because everything he did was to facilitate the making of good music. And, you know, we all uh, have our memories of Jim and what a stickler he was for, um, for all sorts of things. And it was all for that reason, to, to, to make the best musical result. And um, incidentally, I've, I've just remembered, I'm going to treat this as a, uh, as a, um, a way of atoning for my sins. You may remember I, I gave a, a, um, a recital at Brentford Musical Museum, sorry, Kew Bridge Musical Museum last year at the end. And a number of people commented on the solidity of the tuning there. And I, I had it on my list to say thank you to Len Rawl for, for doing that, for his excellent tuning work. And I forgot in the heat of the moment. So sorry, Len, but I was going to give you a shout out, as the saying goes, for, for your excellent tuning work. Uh, you know, it, it's tough. It's tough to get a unit organ in really tight tune. And, and Len is one of the people that knows how to do that really well. And it makes the job of the artist so much, so much better. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's quite unusual to find an instrument in such tight tune, particularly given the, the, the atmospheric conditions we all have to go through. Another person who can do it really well is, is John Parker in Sydney. Incidentally, I, I don't mind uh, saying a big vote of thanks to, to John, one of the uh, memorable experiences of my last Australian tour was playing at the Orion Centre in Sydney. And again, I, I rarely, if ever, played a Wurlitzer organ in tighter tune. And it, it just makes them come to life. So yes, I love the technical aspects. I love getting my hands dirty and helping out. And I hope that makes me a better organist. Now, how do you suggest that we get audiences back to concerts when this pandemic is all over? Well, I wish I had the, the golden answer to that. I'd market it and uh, retire to a desert island early. Um, this is something, of course, which is a big question in the minds of anyone is associated in, in all the arts, not just in the organ world, certainly not just in the theatre organ world. Uh, friends of mine who work in the theatre and uh, in amateur choirs, well, professional choirs and other, other avenues of the arts are having the same uh, dialogue at the moment. I suppose baby steps, slowly but surely. Um, there's a, a, a large part of me, and I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking this, which feels that the pandemic has, in a great uh, sense, brought forward the inevitable, I, I brought forward the discussions, the situations that certainly in the theatre organ world, we would probably have been facing five years down the line in terms of declining audiences and uh, finding new ways to spread the message. And it's encouraged us to up our technological game, certainly in terms of live streamed events and things like that. Uh, so I think this conversation was always going to happen sooner or later in our, our theatre organ world. Um, and I think that it just comes back down to the question of what was it that brought people to events before the pandemic? And because even then, even when there was a free freedom of movement to go and do, to, to go to any concert you wanted, people didn't or were, were selective about what they went to see. And we have to understand why they did that and what we can give them, which will encourage them to come back. You know, why is it that if there are two concerts on the same day, people choose to go to one and not the other? It's not just the instrument, it's not just the music, it's not just the artist, it's not just the venue, it's all of these things put together. And I think that, that the big word is quality. I think we need to offer the highest quality of events, highest quality musically, the highest quality presentationally, uh, the, the, the highest overall experience, because why would you get out of your armchair and come to travel 
a distance to go and listen to something when you could turn on the TV or put on a DVD and have it from the comfort of your armchair. Yes, we know that being there in person is a completely different experience, just like going to see a film with 2,000 other people is, is hugely different from sitting at home watching a DVD. But uh, we have to recognise that we have to work with technology, not against it. And I would encourage, or certainly wouldn't be dismayed, to see fewer concerts, but of a higher quality. Um, don't get me wrong, I absolutely love playing to people and I'm very grateful when they come to my concerts uh, and I hope that that doesn't disappear but I am one of those people who does think that the the format of the two-hour theatre organ concert is perhaps not one that's going to be in an unchanged guise forevermore and we do need to think more widely and I think we need to bring a wider scope to the theatre organ it does so many things wonderfully well it's a wonderful accompanying instrument the reason it was invented was to accompany silent films and silent films are certainly having a huge popularity um, uh, in, influx of, of, of people who are very keen on going to see that and a much younger audience too in many cases and we need to work with that and bring the theatre organ perhaps down to its roots a bit more uh, but there's no there's no single single uh, factor which joins it all together except for quality that I can think of off the top of my head. So I think uh, let's make every event a winner. Let's go for quality rather than quantity. Well, I suppose time will inevitably tell. Indeed. Now, what aspirations might you have in the future, even in music or anything else? Well, it's hard for me not to mention music in some way because it is something that uh, is my life. Uh, people used to ask me what I did when I wasn't making music and the answer would be sleep. Uh, and those, people, those of us who are musicians know that it's hard to detach music from your being. It, it, it is just who, who you are. Um, in terms of the musical world, there's plenty of repertoire I want to learn. Uh, there are lots of uh, arrangements I want to make. Uh, I want to embrace more of the music tech side of things, as I was saying earlier. Um, I do. To, to go back to an even earlier conversation, want to make some more recordings. I've got some things I want to say to pick up on that conversation and some instruments I think need to be captured for posterity. Uh, so there's some a lot of work that can go into preparing that. Uh, I want to work more, I think, probably in other musical fields. Um, I've been doing quite a lot of choral conducting recently and that's something I, I want to do more of, uh, maybe a bit of orchestral co uh, conducting. A little bit more composition. That's something I haven't really explored. Um, I mean, there's quite enough bad music in the world without me adding to it, but it's always nice to, to, uh, to hone your skills in that, that way. Uh, and I suppose probably my, one of my greatest ambitions um, between now and the Pearly Gates um, is to have my own studio organ. I've always wanted my very own studio pipe organ, uh, theatre organ. Uh, somewhere where I can set the instrument up and enjoy it and make music on, on my own time without having to worry about somebody else's time. Because, of course, when, you, when you're playing theatre organs, you have to go and uh, are very um, uh, reliant on the good nature of other people to, to help facilitate that. Uh, so, yes, I'd like to have my own studio organ at some point. And uh, that is something I will at some point find a way of working towards i hope and uh, last but not least uh, uh, a light-hearted music which is outside of music although you've already said it, it could be sleep what other interests do you have lots of things uh what do i like i'm, I'm infatuated with motor cars always have been again growing up uh, with uh, an engineer as a grandfather probably sowed the seeds of that one. I've always been passionate about all kinds of, of cars. I suppose with organs, there tends to be some kind of transport geekery, doesn't it? Um, I'm not so much into trams or, or buses, but I am very much into cars. That's my, that's my mode of geekery. Um, both classic cars and to some degree modern cars. Not so much racing cars, but, you know, um, everyday sort of road cars. Uh, fountain pens are a big 
passion and hobby of mine. I, I like to collect fountain pens and uh, I refuse if possible to write with anything other uh, just to, to get my, my old fogey side going. Uh, I like to cook. I like to eat I have what used to be called food and drink in the old days, I suppose. Um, and I like going to things. I like going to concerts and plays and all those things that we've been starved of over the last few years. Um, and I look forward to, to getting back, for example, and hearing the John Wilson Orchestra play and that sort of thing that I find feeds me musically and, and emotionally. Thank you very much, Richard. That's been a, a really interesting set of answers. And thank you to all the people that did ask that to Richard. Well, the series is just going to be shelved for a little while now. What with uh, Easter uh, has just passed. Um, and of course, lockdown is hopefully, fingers crossed, being slowly lifted. And we've got a couple of other projects coming up that will be uh, coming out soon. So watch this space. Don't go away. And we'll see you all very soon. Bye for now.